And welcome everybody. I'm really excited about our webinar today. We have so much great information to share. Here we are, the topics. Um, just to kind of give you an overview of how we have our meeting schedule today. We have observations needed. Welcome to the advisory panel members, an update on observations, and then our featured presentation. First off, I'd like to Sincerely welcome Juan, Inez, and Mike, who have um, volunteered for our advisory board. We're so excited to get input. And members of the community, if there's something you'd like to share, um, please let us know. Um, we're trying to make Globe Observer um, Mosquito Habitat Mapper our resources up just exactly what you want. We'd like to make it user-friendly. We want to make our PowerPoints accessible the videos that we have, and we're taking all kinds of input to make this the, the best mosquito season ever. As a special treat and a little bit of a teaser today, I invited Dr. Saram uh, Chelapan and Dr. Ryan Carney from the University of South Florida uh, to uh, just meet with us very briefly. Uh, they will be uh, presenting um, our webinar in May on May 13th. And so you'll get to hear a lot more from them then. So just in about five minutes, they're gonna just come in and talk about uh, a project that they're working on and tell you why your data, the citizen science data that's being collected by Globe Mission Mosquito is so incredibly important. So that's their introduction. They are online now. And um, let's look at the next slide, please. And Cassie's gonna tell you what we've been up to. What we have been up to as a group, I have just a map, we have 423 observations from our last webinar until this morning. So the points are, are on the map and I am so excited to say that we have some good data coming in. How have we been doing from January to March? So including the last webinar data, we have 770 observations from around the world, but I, I went out on a limb and I decided to kind of show you what happens when we work together as a team. So showing all the land cover observations with the mosquito observations, our map looks like this. We have a tremendous amount of observations, over 40,000 since we've started collecting together. And so it's super important to make a land cover observation when you make a mosquito observation. All right, thank you so much for that uh, introduction there. We are doing great work and we are hoping very much that we will begin to ramp up the amount of images that are being collected and uploaded using the Mosquito Habitat Mapper map. And that's why Ryan and Saram are here. They're gonna tell you why in just a second. Uh, today we have a talk about tracking invasive species. And I thought that this was a really important thing to uh, use as a topic because we're just beginning the, um, the mosquito season in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, there is a reason why our data is so important. And so I thought that I would just start with that to get us all engaged and excited about what we're doing. So the next slide will show us what an invasive species is. And if you don't know what invasive means, it just means that these are species that, have, that are somewhere where they don't belong normally. They've been either moved by people, either by boats or planes or boxes or cargo. Maybe they're hitchhikers um, that have moved with cargo from one place to another. Um, there are also, alien species that are what we call climate tracking species. So they come from a place which is close to where, um, where they originated, but as climate is changing, they are moving. So when we have species in the US, for instance, using that as, as example, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, those are both invasive species that are also climate tracking. And so today we're gonna to be talking about two new invasive species that, that are um, important in both uh, uh, the Americas and in Africa today. So let's take another slide. And I just wanted to say that the data that you are providing us, these data it, it are more important than ever. Next slide, please. 
One of the reasons why is that we have all been through and we are all still in the throes of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was just recently um, at the um, American Mosquito Control Association meeting. And one of the messages that came through loud and clear hearing people present on what they've been doing is that uh, the COVID-19 response requires money and the pot of money that has been going towards protecting people from COVID is from what, guess what? Pr the protection of other environmental threats like mosquitoes. And so we have a reduced capacity to control mosquito populations. Um, one, of our, one of the scientists that we work with, uh, Dr. Pan, who works in Peru, he was saying that, mos that the um, reports of mosquitoes are down by 30% right now in the regions where he's doing research, but that doesn't mean anything in terms of how many mosquitoes there are. It means that they have fewer people on the ground actually doing surveillance. So you can see why I'm saying this is something we are doing as well. And we are really an important part of this, I don't wanna say post COVID-19 response, but the COVID-19 and beyond response for mosquitoes. All right, next one, please. The uh, next, uh, problem is the emergence of some new invasive species that are posing new potential health challenges, both in the Americas and in Africa. And we're going to talk about those today. Next one, please. Okay, so I, what I want to do now is I want to show you a video. This is one of uh, the colleagues that uh, Ryan and, and Sri Ram and I share. She's working on a project with us and she's working in Ethiopia. And I asked her if she would just tell us a little bit why, a little bit about a new invasive in Africa and why it's so important to get your photos. So here is Dr. Sarah Zandi from the CDC. Hi, um, I'm a, I guess a mosquito biologist, you could say. Um, I study kind of where the mosquitoes are that transmit microbes that cause disease. Um, and that's really important because um, in order to control diseases or minimize the impact of diseases like malaria or you know dengue, we need to know where the mosquitoes are. And I would argue that that's probably the most important piece of information uh, that we could have. Um, so I'm really excited about, you know, the opportunity to, to see the data that citizen scientists are collecting on where mosquitoes are. There are only, you know, there are not that many field entomologists, unfortunately, out there collecting data and to have the opportunity to really work with citizen scientists and the public is so exciting because it not only scales up the amount of information that we get, but but it really, you know, it helps people connect with their own communities and it helps them to understand where, where these mosquitoes are that might impact their health and their family's health. Um, so where I work now um, in Ethiopia, we have a really interesting situation. Um, a mosquito called Anopheles stevens eye, it's a malaria mosquito. So it's a mosquito that bites at night and can transmit malaria parasites. Um, and was typically known from South Asia, arrived to the continent of Africa in about 2012, it was first detected in, the, in Djibouti. And then in Ethiopia, it was detected in 2016, kind of accidentally. Um, and what makes this malaria mosquito different from other malaria mosquitoes is that this one really likes containers, artificial containers and urban areas where there are lots of people and potentially trash around. And other malaria vectors are thought of as like rural mosquitoes that, you know, live in, in ditches or in rice paddies. Um, so it's really a weird, unique mosquito. And we don't quite know how far it's spread yet in Africa. We know that it's in Ethiopia, Sudan, Somaliland, and Djibouti right now, but we don't know how far it's gone. And the opportunity to work with citizen scientists who are gathering data on mosquitoes anyway, is this, it's really like a golden opportunity to see if we can use those data to help inform where we should look for the mosquito so we can stop its invasion. Um, <laughs> anything else? I'm not sure what else, um, what else I can say. Um, 
I've I've taken a look at some of the data from Mosquito Habitat Mapper in Senegal, and one thing that's really interesting and exciting about it is that the data collected by the citizen scientists is very similar to the data that uh, research entomologists collected when doing malaria larval surveillance in the same location. So I think it's a really exciting opportunity, and and um, I can't wait to see where it goes next and if we can use it to help identify where in Ophelia Stevens eye the next malaria vector may be. Um, no, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Should I say anything else or? <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Thank okay. you, Sarah. <laughs> so her personality totally comes through with that video, right? I just, I just, I just loved how excited and enthusiastic and you know, she just gets me excited about mosquitoes. So it was really, really fun. Okay, next slide, please. So the last uh, point here about why our, our data is more important than other, besides the fact that COVID is limiting what our, our mosquito control agencies can do, and besides the fact that we have these new invasive species that we need a lot of people out there trying to find them and track them, is that your mosquitoes are needed by scientists who are de developing some artificial intelligence to identify larvae using machine language and machine learning. And that's why Ryan and Saram are, are, are here today. And I would like to give them so, a chance just to briefly talk about that. Now, you're gonna just get a taste and you're gonna want, gonna want more, but you're gonna have to wait until May because they're going to get the full hour to show you what they're doing with our data. Take it away, Ryan and Sri. There we go. Thanks, Sri. <laughs> you want to go first, and then I'll share the slides. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my name is Sri Ram. I know I, I do work in AI for biology. I'm relatively new to AI. Actually, only four or five years ago, I started getting into the space and. Uh, I got excited in mosquitoes because uh, I once met a, a, met a lady in 2016 that got pregnant after a very long time, my friend. And she said that she had a mosquito bit me and I just want to know if it's the one that spreads Zika. Up to that point, I thought there was only one mosquito in the world that spreads diseases, you know? And then I learned about the subject a little bit, just got curious and uh, made a lot of friends, a lot of connections, learned a lot. So very briefly, what I'm interested to do is basically use citizen generated data and even data may be generated by you know, modern smart traps that could potentially image a mosquito in order to be able to do two things. You know, one, identify the genus and the species. And furthermore, we now have AI technology that can look at the color patterns to say if the mosquito has been blood fed, maybe even if it's gravid or semi-gravid, you know, meaning it carries eggs in its belly or it has you know, laid its eggs. Again, sorry if I use any terms incorrectly and you know, I'm not an expert in mosquitoes. Uh, and so that's why, you know, your data might be very helpful for us. And now Ryan will take over. Great. Thanks, Sri. So hi, everybody. I'm Ryan Carney. I'm a professor of digital science at the University of South Florida. I've been studying mosquitoes for quite a while. My first job actually after undergrad was uh, working in West Nile virus surveillance in California. And then I did a master's work in dengue. And that has kind of continued uh, ever since. And so the project that uh, we're all working on now, including uh, the CDC scientist, Sarah Zodi, who you just saw, uh, is kind of what I'm gonna talk about very briefly uh, today. So let me see if I can share the screen here and get this up and running. Okay. So can everyone see that? Okay, great. So uh, this is not our work, but rather a really great success story for the power of citizen scientists and citizen science in general uh, to detect invasive species. So this is the first detection of Aedes japonicus in Spain that was detected by a citizen scientist using an app called Mosquito Alert, uh, which basically deals with adult mosquitoes. So they took a picture of an adult mosquito and it was recognized by the entomologist that, oh, this could be this invasive species, Aedes japonicus. And so that's essentially what we're trying to replicate using larval art artificial intelligence, uh, as well as with mosquito ad uh, adults as well. And so just uh, very briefly, because uh, we'll be talking about this uh, in May, when a citizen scientist takes a picture of an adult mosquito, the AI algorithm, the artificial intelligence algorithm can detect what pixels belong to the wing, to the thorax, to the legs, et cetera. And then we'll run the classification algorithm on each anatomical region separately. It'll go through some what are called deep neural networks 
And the end result is a classification that this is most likely this species, uh, this genus, and will also have a quantitative probability assigned to it. So we have that working for the adults, uh, but the way that we were able to build this is by first manually masking out the wings, the thorax, the legs, in order to teach the artificial intelligence what is the wing, what is the leg, et cetera, so that it can separate those out automatically and then run the classification algorithm. And so it, it took a lot of training is what it's called in order to get the artificial intelligence algorithm working. And so right now we are starting this whole process for the larval images and that's where mosquito habitat mapper comes in. So there's basically three different things that we need from you. So first and foremost, observations. Uh, these, obviously this is the raw data that makes everything work. Uh, this is what you know, the research is based on. And what we are trying to target specifically are the two invasive species that Sarah just talked about and Rusty will be talking about, Anopheles stevensi and Aedes vitatus. So if you are in any of those countries, please take as many photos of mosquito larvae in artificial containers. That's really key. So these two species we are targeting, uh, as Sarah mentioned, Anopheles stevensi is a threat as a malaria uh, vector, uh, but please take as many photos as you can of mosquito larvae in a, uh, artificial containers, especially if you are in these, these countries. And as Cassie mentioned before, uh, please take land cover data as soon as you take a mosquito observation, because that is that enables us to do a lot of really cool research as far as uh, what's called GIS, Geographic Information Systems, as, as far as mapping, and especially being able to predict where these invasive species may go next by knowing where they are now. And so it's really, really critical to take the mosquito observation, but then follow that up with the land cover data. So next, we need as many volunteers as possible to help us with the manual masking. So we can teach the algorithm that this is the, the larval head, this is the thorax, this is the siphon, in order to make the algorithm work on its own. And so if you are interested in volunteering for this, uh, you can contact us, I'll, I'll provide my email in the next slide. But that is a very critical uh, step in the process. And the third step is we need to identify the images that have already been, in, uh, been submitted in the Mosquito Habitat Mapper, as well as uh, moving forward. And the way to do this is with professional entomologists who are trained in mosquito identification. So if you know of any of these individuals who are able to identify, say, a mosquito larvae to a genus uh, or even species, we would like to work with them and have them help us identify these, these mosquito images so that we can then train the algorithm. And so that's really the final step is we will then be developing and then deploying the artificial intelligence. And what we mean by deploy is that you'll be able to submit an image of a mosquito larva through Mosquito Habitat Mapper. And in the future, you'll get a link immediately and it, you'll click on it, it'll bring you to a web page, and it will say that mosquito image that you just uploaded is most likely this genus and provide uh, some sort of a quantitative probability. We're also working on being able to flag that and say, oh, this could be an invasive species which means that you might be the first to discover an awfully Steven sign in a new area uh, that will have been enabled through this artificial intelligence real-time detection. So that's sort of our, our overarching goal with all of this. And so just to wrap up here with the call for collaborators, if you are interested in volunteering to help us mask these larval images, please contact us at my email, ryancarney at usf.edu. Second, if you know a local entomologist who is trained in mosquito identification, whether it be larvae or the adults, please have them email us. And finally, uh, if you or someone you know has experience in GIS and is interested in joining our team as either a master's student or a postdoctoral researcher, uh, please have them email us. Uh, we have two year positions uh, for a master's student and a postdoctoral researcher. And so with that, I uh, just remind everybody that uh, Dr. Schlappen and I will be talking more about all this work uh, on May 13th. Thanks. Thank you. And one thing, if I may add, you know, so once the masking is done and let's say we can indeed extract the anatomical components, they could be also fed back to the student scientists, you know, whereby 
they could also engage in learning about how to identify mosquitoes. So next time they upload an image, they could say, well, based on my experience with, you know, learning the thorax, the wing, the abdomen, the, the siphon, etc., I think this is whatever, ADE, Circulex, or Anopheles. So that way, you know, engagement can be promoted also. That is something also which we want to do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, one of the things I think that's very exciting is that as a, as a community of citizen scientists, we're now involved in this National Science Foundation funded research project, which is led by Dr. Ryan and Dr. Chelapan. So I'm really excited that um, they were able to talk to us today for a very short time. And I think you, you know, uh, what is it that Dorian says? It tastes like more. Um, you know, I think that you'll see that you're going to want to be here for their presentation in May. So thank you guys so much. I know you probably can't stay because you've got other things to do, but I uh, really appreciate you putting in a cameo appearance today to this community. Thank you. Pleasure. Much. Thanks for yeah. having us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. So to summarize, submit your photos. We need those photos to find when and where invaders of mosquitoes are and to build this AI product that Ryan and uh, Sri, Sri Ram are, are working on. Okay, so let's take the next slide. And I'm gonna give you a little bit more background. Here are some of the um, articles that been cl I clipped from papers over this past pandemic year. And so obviously um, these invasives are in the news. And you probably didn't see them because almost every headline is COVID-19, but this is the stuff you'll see on page three, right? Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And I'm just gonna talk about two of those. And yes, I think this, we, uh, let's just move on. <laughs> Love to see those guys. I'm happy to see them twice. So I thought that today I would give you a hitchhiker's guide to becoming invasive. And I wish I came up with that title myself, but actually it's by uh, Andrean, uh, Andrea uh, Aguizzi, but I, I thought it was just so perfect. And you know, one of the reasons why invasives are such a problem is that our invasive species are, re are also the ones that are vector species. And um, one of the key traits for invasive success is that just about all the invasives have a very successful adaptation to using artificial containers, which are manufactured containers um, for their immature stages. And so as, um, Dr. Z, Sarah Z was saying uh, the other, um, just a few minutes ago, that's what's so amazing about this Anopheles stephensi, because all the other Anopheles mosquitoes that are, that have the ability to um, pass on the um, plasmodium parasite to, um, as a vector, those are all mosquitoes that live in ditches and tend to uh, find themselves in sort of natural water environments outside, not containers in the house, in your flower pots and around the community. And that's really important because when you have mosquitoes that are adapted to artificial containers, they are much, much more difficult for your mosquito control agencies to control because, uh, because they are, um, uh, day, most of them are actually day biters and so that means that if you want to get the adults, you've got to spray when people are around, and, and that's really no good. And uh, you know, if you're if usually with our spraying um, strategies that we use, we use that in the evening for those mosquitoes that tend to be out at night. And I remember growing up as a kid with the fog truck coming through my you know coming through my neighborhood and close all the windows so it doesn't smell funny. And then you know about half an hour later, we'd all go back outside again. Well. That doesn't really work. And because these guys are, are adapted to grow in very small quantities of water in the bottom of a, a, a piece of trash or a cup, or even they've even found them in bottle caps, uh, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for a municipality to have enough mosquito control people out there doing um, lar larviciding and mitigating those habitats. And that is why over the past few years, citizen science is becoming more and more important. Um, so, uh, so here are some of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Becoming Invasive. They have this key trait of being able to adapt to artificial containers. Like many organisms, but all mosquitoes, they have rapid reproduction and growth. They have fast generation times. They have high dispersal ability. And um, 
they also have characteristics that allow animals, like we see with the West Nile virus, the um, uh, the the way that mosquitoes are involved in the, the West Nile virus uh, cycle with birds, or characteristics facilitating humans by traveling in water containers or on our boats or in our planes. These characteristics allow them to disperse more widely and become actual invasive species. They're, uh, you know, not all organisms are as genetically plastic as others are, and they tend to be have a high adaptability to new conditions. And one of the things that uh, we see with Aedes aegypti, with Aedes albopictus, with the new one, Aedes vitatus that uh, Ryan introduced is that they have a tolerance of the eggs drying out. And this is a, this, this is a, a, a key feature that allows those mosquitoes to, tr to travel as eggs and you know, be in a dormant state. And when they get to a place where there's water, then they can burst forth and multiply. So these are all the things that are really important. And if they get to a place where they are actually able to outcompete the native organisms in their new range, which is the case with many of these invasive species, then we have a problem. And so that's what we're trying to face. And that's one of the things that we are doing with our mosquito habitat mapper. Okay, next one, please. I just wanted to put this here. I, I don't want you to sit it and memorize it, but I just want you to see all the different species here because we've been talking mostly about Aedes aegypti and Aedes um, albopictus because we can identify those in the in the app. But for instance, you know the southern house mosquito, uh, Culex quinquefasciatus. We think of that as a U.S. mosquito, but actually it comes from Africa, uh, probably in the fifth in the fifteenth century, or I'm mean, sorry, the sixteenth, yeah, fifteenth century they came over. Um, so just see all the different ones. You can see that they come from all different places and they go to all different places and they either are trans, um, uh, transferred through things like uh, old tires or in plants like lucky bamboo was a way that we got a lot of the Aedes albopictus around the world. Uh, pots and storage containers, water containers um, in the transatlantic human trafficking boats that were part of the slave trade um, in the mid, in the mid um, 1600s, 1700s. Um, and uh, for instance, I thought it was really interesting to find out that um, one of the malaria vectors in the Amazon was uh, transferred through um, boats going up the Amazon and it started out in the central Amazon. Now it's found in the North Amazon, Amazon and places like Iquitos now is a hotspot for malaria. So boats, planes, ships, all these things are, are ways that mosquitoes are able to move. Okay, the next one, please. All right, if I wanted to put all the invasives on here, I don't even think you'd see the continents, but these are some of the most important ones. And the only point for this is just to see that the 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 the, um, the arrows are going back and forth in multiple directions. Okay, next one, please. All right, so this is this is actually re repetitive. This is what Ryan showed us, but this is the the movement of the um, an Anopheles stephensi that uh, Dr. Sarazani talked about today. And you'll see that they, uh, they originally were found in um, West Asia, India, and then they moved towards uh, further into West Asia into the Arabian Peninsula, and then began to move down into uh, Africa. Okay, so now we're, so now we're seeing the, the movement of these, these guys. And these observations are done either by entomologists or they could also be done by citizen scientists like yourselves. And you know, when an invasive first comes, maybe you only see one or two. Um, okay, and I think that's all the way through. So now we can go to the next slide. So you know, when you first have an invasive mosquito come into an area, you might only see two or three in the first year, and then suddenly you'll have many others. So. Um, this is now a map. I believe Ryan also showed this same map, but what we can see is that uh, this is the original range of the 80s vit vitatus mosquito that we just found in the 
the U.S. this spring. Uh, it was found originally in, in Asia and in Africa. It then moved to the Domini to Haiti and Cuba. And then uh, there was an article in February that it has been identified in Dade County in, uh, in Florida. And so um, they're pretty beautiful mosquitoes. They have these wonderful white scales on their abdomen that are quite nice. And then Ryan and I, I asked Ryan if he knew uh, how to identify the larva. And it's just like in the key, if you're trying to identify between 80s Egypti and 80s Albopictus, and other 80s. If you have an, another 80s, it says that there are there is a tuft in between the pectin. And sure enough, 80s vitatus, you can tell it's an 80s vitatus because of where that tuft is in the pectin. So it's pretty hard to identify, but just finding 80s in your specimens and give us those photographs is really important. All right, next one, please. Okay, so why do we care about these invasive mosquitoes? I've already given you the punchline. Most vector species are also invasive species. And we have been talking for the past year in this, um, in our citizen science group about these two, the Aedes albopictus, which is the um, Asian tiger mosquito and Aedes aegypti, which is the yellow fever mosquito and how they are now found all over the world wherever mosquitoes live, which, excludes, I believe, only Antarctica. Um, this is, a, it's a big problem. So Aedes vitatus um, also is in this group. It vectors all of the dangerous mosquito-borne diseases that Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti does, plus other ones that they don't do, uh, such as um, dog heartworm and some other things. And uh, one of our friends, Yvonne Linton, she is at the Walter Reed um, Biodiversity Unit, was quoted in this article about Aedes vitatus, and she says, what well, you've just learned, the aids, the eggs can tolerate being dried out. They can be moved around. And then when there's water, they emerge. And if it's, they're in a right, the right climate, they will have generation after generation after generation. And in case you don't know what a vector is, it's just an organism that can, tr that can transfer a pathogen that causes disease from one host to another host. So it's the, the connection point. All right, great. I think we're almost done here. Let's take another peek. This is the just to, to, to summarize about 80s uh, Stephen Tsai, um, just that this, once again, it, it this is a very different mosquito than the other ones that are responsible as vectors for malaria. It's the first one they found that's found in containers, which means we as citizen scientists are the first line of defense to find these and get rid of them. So we have our charge ahead of us. So if you're in Africa, here you go. Next one, please. All right, so I promised that I would tie this up to uh, talking about climate change. And uh, the most important thing for me to say here is that what climate change is one of the reasons that we're seeing more mosquitoes uh, moving um, north and south of the equator, they're expanding their, their zones where they're able to survive. But it's also a very, very complicated story. And we, you know, the only way that we can predict what things are like is we have to run a climate model and then see whether or not those organisms are gonna be able to live under the conditions that there, there are. Most of these models that we see in these articles are looking just at temperature. And um, this is an insufficient way of looking at this because I think you already are getting an idea. You already know humidity is a factor. Rainfall is a factor. Temperature is a factor. Whether or not they're competing species are a factor. Are these guys individuals that have gene plasticity so they're able to adapt to new conditions? So it's very, very complex. But there are people that are trying to deal with this complexity in their research. Next one. So here we are, it's not a simple connection. And then, oh, I forgot to mention, that's why I have this slide, is that not only do we have the natural factors of the climate and the biological factors of the mosquitoes, but people are playing a big role too in where these mosquitoes are found. Because if we migrate, take our packages with us, we might be bringing mosquitoes with us. 
urbanization, cutting down forests, land cover change, all these things are also implicated in expanding species range for mosquitoes. And we do have models, but um, as a climate scientist, I can tell you one of the things that the models can't capture adequately is abrupt changes where you have extreme events because those can actually set off a whole biological chain of action. And they're very, very hot, hard to model, but they can have very significant consequences. Okay, let's go to the next one. So I just wanted to show you climate is really important, but I, this is a very complex diagram. You might wanna look at this maybe offline, but basically you've got people, you've got, which includes the vertebrate hosts, that could be birds, that could be people. You've got the vector circle there in the middle of the Venn diagram. You've got the pathogen. There's the risk right in the middle. And then look at all the things that are impacting it. The environment, the environmental niche the mosquito is found in, the physical environment, like the land cover, things like that. Then you have travel and trade, global change, human impact, socioeconomic conditions, and finally climate. So it's very, very complex. Luckily, there are people that are wrapping their head around these questions. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's go forward. Because the last thing I wanted to show you is how as a mosquito habitat mapper scientist, as part of the Globe Mission Mosquito community, you are actually also an earth scientist because the earth system is the interactions between the living things, the biosphere, the air, the water, and the geology and the soil. And so this is called the earth system. And when one thing changes in one part of the system, it changes in the other. And you know, when we created the uh, Globe Observer app, what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that all parts of the Earth system were included and sampled in this app so that people could begin to look at Earth system interactions. And so you'll see that clouds helps to tell us about the atmospheric conditions and the rainfall. We have trees that tells us a little bit about the vegetation, which is on the ground, specifically the, the canopy vegetation. We have the mosquito habitat mapper, which is, re, which is responding to changes in the trees. We have the land cover, which plays a role in not only in the atmospheric moisture and the local ground cover, but also in how many mosquitoes that you're found. And so it's all one big system. So this slide, I hope will help you, will help to motivate you to, to try whenever possible, whenever you make a mosquito observation measurement, to also do a land cover measurement. Our scientists desperately need coincidental data, data taken at the same place at the same time using multiple tools. So um, those tool, the two tools that are most important for the scientists that we're working with right now are land cover and mosquitoes. We'd love to get um, a description of the heights of some of the trees in that area to better understand the land cover. And of course, clouds tells us a little bit more about, what the veget about what's happening to the vegetation because of the environmental conditions. So that's just a little slide talking about the earth system. And then I want to introduce who we're gonna be talking with um, next month. So the next slide, please. And that will be Dr. Mike Wimberly who is one of these guys that is taking on this really incredible modeling challenge. And he will be talking about how he uses um, satellite data from NASA. And I think I mentioned some of these already, the land cover, the humidity, the precipitation, um, temperature. A lot, there's a lot of different variables that he looks at. And then he also uses cases of disease. He also looks at socioeconomic data. And then all this information is put into a model and it is run and the, he uses that to develop predictive models of vector-borne disease in the areas that he's studying. And so he was, he's been working in South Dakota. He is now doing some work in Oklahoma. He's also doing a work in two regions in Africa, but it's very, very exciting. And you're not gonna wanna miss this talk that ties the mosquito work that we do to the whole earth system. All right, with that again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, please check out the globe.gov website um, to find our most current 
but I am going to put out one call and hold on just a second, but I want to share what we really need. We really need you to sign up to be a judge for the International Virtual Science Symposium. Just a quick look just for mosquito projects and we found that there's over 45. And so if we could get some, you can, it's a real quick commitment. You can review as little as one or if you're a member of the GLOBE community and you'd like the badge on your profile, you need to review at least three. And so we could definitely use your help with that. So if you could please sign up to be a judge, the link is right there. And with that, I'm going to say thank you so much and we'll see you in April.